Welcome everybody to today uh, to number six of our biological webinar series. A um, few housekeeping rules. Everybody is muted and, and your video is, is blocked. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the, the Q&A box and you know, there'll be time at, at the end of the webinar here to, to answer those questions. And uh, with that, Keith, I'll, I'll let you introduce our speaker today. All right, well, thanks, Dylan. Uh, it's our pleasure uh, this afternoon uh, or this morning, depending on where you're at, I guess, uh, to have Laura Decker uh, on. Laura is the president of uh, Prolific Earth Sciences and the Microbiometer. Uh, Laura and I actually were on the same panel, uh, Regenerative Agriculture panel. We spoke at a conference in Washington, D.C. Gosh, when was that, Laura? Back in October or something, I think. October November, October. yeah. Yeah, and so I got the pleasure to meet her there, and we were able to visit and found that we have a lot of things in common, uh, both with a, a really a great interest in soil biology, but also uh, the tool that, that her company has uh, is really an innovative test. Uh, that is being utilized by people all over the world. So she'll share a little bit about that as well. And so uh, Laura's company uh, is, is developing products and methods that allow soil stewards all across the world to um, determine the impact of their regenerative practices on soil health. And one of the nice things about the way they have their structured is you don't have to send it into a lab. You can use your cell phone uh, to determine that microbial biomass, which is really important because in some of these countries where they work, uh, they do a lot in Australia and India and South America, uh, they just don't have access to some of the labs that we're you know, fortunate enough here in the United States to have access to. Uh, so one of the cool things is their product is opening up some of that, that testing and that way to assess soil health uh, to people uh, all across the globe. So that's kind of a cool thing. Uh, so Laura is going to talk about the importance of soil microbes and, and how they kind of fit into the whole system. And if you've joined us for a lot of the sessions that we've had so far, uh, this is going to fit in really nicely with some of the composting sessions uh, that we've done, you know, making your own compost. Uh, and so Laura is going to restress some of those points. Uh, and then again, towards the end, she will be sharing a little bit about the, the actual microbiometer uh, testing kit that you can get and use to do that. So uh, I know Laura is originally from New York, where the company is located, but she now hails from the Pacific Northwest. She lives in the Seattle area, and uh, so she gets a lot of frequent flyer miles traveling back and forth. So uh, I'm glad my commute's not that far, Laura. So thank you for joining us. Welcome, and I will let you take it from here. Oh, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, uh, I had to, I forgot my little kit box, so I had to grab that. I think I'll start, first of all, thank you for everyone for, for tuning in. This is a really neat series on, on how to change practice and try different practices in terms of going regenerative. Um, I have a little presentation that talks a little bit about soil biology. I found that um, it helps to level set when we start talking about soil testing and soil microbes, a little bit about the science. There's certainly a lot more out there. So I think um, some of you might, um, if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen. Some of you, this might be too basic and some this might be new, but we're going to go through it. Um, and then we'll talk about, about me. So there we go. Is it, is it uh, up and running? Um, so this, we're going to talk a little bit about understanding the role of soil microbes in agriculture and in soil structure and soil health. Uh, as Keith said, my name is Laura Decker. I'm the president of Prolific Earth Sciences. We are a very small company, as many companies are in regenerative um, and family based again, as many are in agriculture. We are located in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York. Um, and we're just four people and we do all our own manufacturing and uh, shipping. Um, and we are pretty committed to the economy of the Hudson Valley. So we do um, as much sourcing of supplies and labor as we can um, from the local areas. Um, so symbiosis. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the symbiosis between plants and microbes. Um, so one of the things that sort of conventional agriculture has, has done over the past 100, 150 years is start feeding plants directly uh, through chemistry. But really plants are designed to be um, fed through biology, okay? So it's not that there's not fertilizers, but really the natural uh, or more sort of uh, uh, 
normal system is for bacteria and fungi and all kinds of nematodes and worms to be working in the soil with the plants in a symbiotic relationship. So the bacteria and the fungi work together. Um, bacteria are quite small. They have very little DNA and they can only manufacture certain compounds. Um, but they need a lot of things to live. So what they do is trade. It's a, just a sort of, I like to think of it as a cool medieval village, you know, bacteria A will make a certain compound. Bacteria B needs that compound, but bacteria B makes a compound that A needs. And so they trade back and forth, right? As sort of one um, entity. Um, and then the plant is the same thing. So plants, um, need uh, nitrogen and, and all kinds of things from the soil, but the plants feed the soil, in the microbes in the soil, and the microbes in the soil feed the plants. So one of the things in the cycle you can see on the picture is nitrogen fixation, phosphate uptake, um, ethylene regulation, and um, it is a little too scientific for me, someone else made it, but you can see in this plant, this is the rhizosphere, the area around the roots, Okay, we know that roots um, stimulate bacterial growth. Oh, that's my cat. Um, and, um, and that root growth will create uh, more surface area for bacteria. Um, so this is just a real quick picture that shows what you do when you supply chemical nutrition to plants. Um, so this is a control plant right here. And these are the plants, this is underground, um, and above ground. Um, <clears throat> if you give it phosphate chemically, you can see that the root growth is a lot less. If you give it nitrate, which it loves, um, you can see the root growth is, is significantly less. And there you go through. Um, and what that is significantly is plants, when they expend energy, do it only if they need to do it. So they have a lot of roots and a lot of root hairs if they need to mine those microbes to get nutrition. If they're getting the nutrition chemically through an input, they don't expend the energy to make those root hairs, right? Because they don't need to. Um, it's just sort of like, like all all biological beings are quite conservative in terms of their energy. But we do know that roots, right, underground roots is a big part of building soil structure and putting soil uh, matter, soil organic matter into the soil. So if over years and years you do not promote good root growth, in the soil there won't be decomposing root growth, which is food for microbes and plants, okay. Healthy soil is dependent on the microbial community for lots of things, and there's a lot more information on this on the web. Um, plant required minerals and nutrients, right? We know that they trade uh, nutrients back and forth between them, and that microbes make um, chemicals in the soil bioavailable to plants. So there's often like phosphate, uh, phosphorus a lot in the soil, but plants can't get to it directly. They need the microbes to make it available to them. Digestion of litter. So that's all those roots that are in there. The microbes will recycle those and turn those into soil carbon. And soil structure, okay? So soil structure, I have a whole slide on that, is one of the most important things that soil biology does. And we know that soil structure increases water holding capacity, protection from erosion, um, and keeps the, the soil naturally aerated. Um, and also plants and animals, this is a really cool science if you wanna get into it, sort of talk to each other about the conditions. There have been um, studies that have shown that if certain pathogens come to, um, come to a plant, um, they'll release hormones, the, the microbes in the plants will release hormones to deter those um, pathogens. Um, oh, sorry, there we go. And microbes also sequester carbon into the soil. Uh, about 60% of a microbe's body is sort of carbon. And when they die, that carbon goes into the soil, both as sequestered carbon, which, you know, is becoming a big thing uh, economically and environmentally, but also that sequestered carbon becomes carbon stores for microbes to be able to consume when things are lean, right? So it's sort of like filling the freezer for the soil, if you will. Here it is, soil carbon stores. 
um, soil organic carbon SOC is broken down um, plant material, essentially. There's two kinds, soluble, which is fresh. That's sort of like very readily available broken down plant material close to the surface, right? If you've ever worked with compost, really good compost, it boosts your soil because it brings some fresh soil organic carbon um, to the soil. So to give your, your plants and your microbes a big boost, right? Um, and compost also contains usually a lot of microbes. So you get sort of two benefits. Um, and then there's stored, which is also called stable organic carbon. And that's the carbon that's sort of harder to reach. Um, it's carbon from dead microbes. It's litter from plants. And that is really what makes your soil resilient if you have stored stable organic carbon. It takes a very long time to build um, stable carbon in your soil, um, and it can get depleted rather quickly um, through through maybe some tilling, um, burning, and things like that. So it's one of those things that I'm unfortunately like um, is, is hard to get, but easy to lose. Um, so here's a little picture of, of sort of the process of um, uh, building uh, both fresh soil organic carbon and um, stable. Um, so when we talk about adding inputs, um, a lot of them start with fresh and then they work to build the stable organic carbon in the soil. Um, building a balanced microbial community, um, and this is why there's so much content online and why there's so many really interesting webinars like these. It's really, there's no formula, I guess, yet. Maybe they'll come up with one. It depends on your soil clump climate, the crops you're growing, and the history of what's been going on with your soil. Um, but we do know that the, the goal is to create optimal conditions in your soil for microbes to thrive, and then the plants that you grow on it to also thrive, okay? The microbial community can do this if given the right food and conditions. So again, when we talk about uh, a lot of inputs and amendments, what we're talking about is not necessarily feeding your plant directly, but indirectly through soil microbes, creating soil structure, um, healthy soil um, to then feed those plants. Um, and then feeding microbes enables the micro microbial community to start rebuilding the cycle of healthy soil. We also talk a lot when we talk to people about microbes is um, you know, what kind? Do I have any bad microbes or good microbes, right? Um, and that's kind of a hard question. There's, I don't know. Sometimes I say millions, sometimes I build, say billions. I'm not sure how many different kinds of microbes there are in the soil, but there's a lot. We have not DNA sequenced them. We certainly know the ones, you know, that cause a lot of problems in the world. Um, but we do know that of the many, many microbes that there are, that diversity is the key to having resilient soil. We talked before about how microbes symbiotically depend on each other. So the, the and in general, we say the bigger your community is, right, the sort of more diverse it is, just like a medieval village, right? They grow up, there's farmers, and then people specialize, right? And they trade back and forth. Same thing. So the goal is to have as large a community as you can, not just so you have lots of microbes out there working, but because you have lots of different microbes out there, feeding different micronutrients to the plants, um, protecting from different pathogens, and building these um, soil structure modules, okay? Um, and also, um, some of the microbes can be virulent, right? Uh, it, it's sort of, um, it's called quorum sensing. I don't think I go into, into this slide, but there are some microbes that are normally, you know, like people pretty good, but if they get together with the wrong, you know, like, like middle schoolers or something, they get with the wrong friends, they'll sort of attack. Um, quorum sensing, if you have a big diverse population, will prevent microbes from bad or, or sort of problematic microbes from growing to a level that they can attack plants and other microbes. Solutions. So that's why, obviously, we're all here. We talk about it. The solutions um, to, to improving soil health and soil structure um, and natural soil fertility are chemical fertilizers, microbial inputs, and biostimulants, and of course, cover crops, right, which is a big one. So chemical fertilizers, you know, um, they're expensive, and they, and over time, overuse of them depletes the microbial population, right? We do know that if you put chemicals into the plant, uh, into the soil, 
that are readily available for the plant, the plant will stop feeding the microbes, right? And start the sort of vicious cycle of deteriorating the soil. We also know um, that, that chemical fertilizers have done a ton um, for the world food population, and they are quite effective. So that's why regenerative agriculture is so um, appealing to so many people, because it stresses judicial use of these. Microbial in inputs are also uh, a great way to do it. Mycorrhizal fungi is one of people's famous. Um, most of the time, when people just put microbial inputs into the soil, if their soil is such that it cannot support microbial life, they will sort of live and die, right? Um, research is ongoing, but it's unclear also how much microbial populations vary by location and crop. So sort of a one size fit all works in some places and not others. Um, but again, um, a lot of the inputs that are there now have a combination both of microbial input and um, food for those microbes like compost and cover crops. Cover crops are one of those things that if if anyone working on soil health could, you know, wave a wand, we'd say everyone does cover crops, right? Um, it's the mantra of ecoag, which is no bare soil. It keeps roots in the soil. It keeps down erosion. It keeps the soil carbon cycle going, um, and it keeps those microbes alive uh, even in in winter or when things are bare. Okay. Um, and biostimulants. So that's another one. Um, they work because they provide better conditions for microbes to grow, okay? And they help perpetuate a system that reduces reliance on chemical fertilizers. So biostimulants, and there's lots of different names for them. I'm not as versed in them, but these are things that will feed the microbes and work with the soil structure that's there. Um, so here's where we come in. Of course, I'm here to talk about my company, the microbiometer. So we do know that soil microbial life is incredibly important. Uh, people know that fungal content is really one of the big drivers of soil um, structure, um, and also in crops um, that you eat, wine, cannabis, uh, berries, fungal content does a lot for taste and quality. Um, but one of the things, why, why the founder of our company, Judith Fitzpatrick, started it is she saw that the tests out there were mostly lab-based um, or respiration based, which she thought was problematic. Um, so the microbiometer is a kit. I have one here. It's designed to be portable. You test field moist, fresh soil, and you use your cell phone to read the results. Okay. So it's designed to sort of mimic microscopy. Um, but on, on um, I know it doesn't look it, but our test card there has a small uh, window to look at it. And, and that's much larger than you would look at um, through a microscope. Um, it's a very fast test, it takes 20 minutes. You can do it in the field, although most people take the soil and, and do it at home. There's no lab and you use your cell phone, it stores all the results. And the, the reason that people use it in the regenerative world is to be able to sort of baseline where is their soil in terms of microbial life and where is it going, right? As I use different practices or different products, am I improving the soil microbes, right, through time? Am I gaining a real understanding of both the growing changes in the microbes, the seasonal changes, and how they react to different cover crops, different inputs, and even different kinds of compost. So it is a tool that gives people data. It is not a recommendation tool. We don't, you don't take the test and, and, and be told what to do with your soil. Um, we don't do that. We're test makers, not agronomists. Um, that's where companies um, like Green Cover come in to help you sort of understand what you should do to make things better or how to tweak your existing practices. So we manufacture and ship this directly. Um, it's fairly cost effective. A starter kit's $135. Um, and, and as Keith mentioned, um, one of our big missions is to go uh, more into small scale farming. We're doing a, a partnership now in Africa. Um, a lot of the, the food that's consumed on this planet is grown by small scale farmers in India and Africa and places like that. And this is a tool that's readily accessible to them um, to, to start rebuilding natural soil fertility, um, improve the environment, improve the quality of food, um, and also improve the finances of farming, right? Farming is a business for people, but it's also how we all live. Um, and so if people can reduce um, 
expensive fertilizers and use more economical processes to have the soil naturally feed their crops, they will be more um, financially and food secure. So that's us. Um, here's my little slide. Uh, I'm Laura at Microbiometer. Again, I said we're a pretty small company um, and we love to talk to growers um, and people who are using the kit out in the field. Um, but I guess I, that's sort of my, my canned presentation. Um, if we want to, um, have a discussion afterwards. Yeah, Laura, we have, we do have a couple questions here, um, that we can, we could kind of go over, um, see, uh, can you compare the results you get from a microbiometer test to what you might see on a PLFA test? Yeah. So, and I'll talk a little bit about them. So, um, you'd think it'd be easy, right, to test stuff, right? It's just, it, 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 and, and, and it makes sense, right? It's like, I want to see how many micros are in my soil. It should be as similar as just stepping on a scale. Um, PLFA measures um, certain uh, products or certain chemicals and substances inside microbes, okay? So we don't correlate with PLFA because we don't have a window into what microbes have what chemicals, okay? Um, and 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 our soil person is not here. Um, and I, I'm not sure people who who use PLFA if, if it's on dried soil. One of our big tenants is that you are, when you're looking at soil microbes, you are looking at living things. So you do not want a long period of time between taking the soil out of the ground and testing it, right? So you don't want to send it somewhere for two days because two things might happen. Some things might die, but some things might do better in a little Ziploc bag, right? So you would have, you know, either too high or too low. Um, and we also don't think that drying, killing microbes and reconstituting them makes any sense at all um, in order to see what was there. You don't kill everything and then see if it'll come back to see what, what was there. Um, so PLFA, um, you know, is not used that much, particularly around the world um, because of it. The other test um, that's out there is the Haney test, the respiration. Um, and again, respiration is mostly used in the United States. It's a, it's a, the USDA likes it a lot. Um, the Haney test is, is incredibly useful, um, but it measures respiration, which is the rate at which microbes um, sort of breathe, right, respire. Um, and you can have dormant microbes that aren't actively um, producing carbon and they wouldn't show up on Haney. You could have sort of very chill, happy microbes that are that are that um, have a low metabolism that read low, or you could have very, very stressed out microbes that are working really, really hard with high respiration. So we think that it tells you something about the soil, but not necessarily the total community. Um, that's not to say it's not a good test. Um, when Judy designed it, she was a microbiologist, so she loved microscopy. So what she wanted to do is say, how can we sort of, without, you know, arming everyone with an expensive microscope, and also reading slides is incredibly difficult. Um, how can we figure out a way to mimic it? And one of the things um, that I'll say about the test is when you have especially really good soil, the microbes are tied up in the soil particles. So the first thing you have to do to test soil microbes is to separate them from the soil particles. So we have a funny little, it looks like a science experiment. You take the, my, the soil, put it in a salt solution that helps break up the bonds between the soil and the microbes, and we whisk it in a very controlled way to try to separate them. So we get a microbial soup that we put on our test card that then get red. Okay, so if you leave the solution too long, it's salt water, all the microbes will die, right? So it, it's, a, it's a very specific time test, but it doesn't correlate with PLF, PLFA because we didn't go into the science of what it does. Um, we've had a lab, Earthfort, correlate it to, to their microscopy. They have a PhD there who does microscopy. Um, and so we've correlated with microscopy and with carbon fumigation extraction at times, um, which is a very complicated, crazy dangerous method of testing soil that only um, academics do. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't think anyone out there would do that because uh, you can you can explode things. It's a thing. Okay. So what? And then when you 
when you go ahead and and make this solution and put it on the test card, what is it what is it actually telling you then? Yeah. So what the microbial sort of solution will do is when you put it on the test card, the test card has a specialized membrane that will sort of wick away the water and leave on the test card. And I have one here. The the microbes. Um, this test is designed for natural, naturally occurring soil, okay? Not crazy engineered soil, not hydroponic soil, but really God-given soil. And what we filled, here's my test cards. Here they are. They're very little. The membrane will wick away the water and the microbes will be on the membrane. Um, and we know that microbes and fungi pick up pigmentation naturally in the soil, which is why hydroponics is not a good fit for our test. And we have an algorithm in the app that we worked on for years and years um, that reads the color of it. You can see there's a grayscale around it and returns a result of it. We actually return microbial carbon, which is um, similar to biomass. Um, and it's a number, right? We turn you a number from zero to about 3,000, 3,000 being, you know, only people who um, sing to their cannabis soil at night, right, in little pots. Um, and um, and you use it not to compare to Haney or PLFA or anything else, but to compare to the soil over time. So we call our test a, a benchmark test. Um, I assume as time goes on, uh, microbial tests will get a little bit more standardized, but we on purpose didn't use the same metrics as Haney and PLFA because we didn't want people to think that, you know, each method is a little different um, and, it, and it, it uses different things. But, you know, in our mind thinking about how to measure microbial soil, the big thing was test it as soon as you can and um, test it while they're still alive. Uh, and our test also pick, picks up dormant spores which is important in the winter okay sure yeah. so on, on that number that's just kind of like a you know i guess how does that where would you see maybe a, a modern agricultural yeah you know, so, that, and, and is that my is that fungal or more bacterial so reading? yeah so a lot of the times um under 200 reading is considered fairly poor soil okay um, agricultural soil is normally between 200 and 600, 600 being good. And sort of boutique container soil can be as high as, you know, 2,500, 3,000. But that is not anyone growing anything significant. Um, agricultural soil, a lot of people strive for a one-to-one -one fungal to bacteria ratio. Uh, and again, it's not one fungal being to one microbe. It's sort of mass, right? Because fungi are much bigger than microbes. Um, but people who are growing often um, uh, grapes and berries want a higher uh, fungal content or, or people who are using microbial or mycorrhizal fungi inputs, um, when they use the test, sometimes they'll, they'll test it before they put the mycorrhizal fungi down and then they'll test it a couple of weeks later to see if it goes up the ratio. Okay. Um, we have discovered when we first designed the test, uh, we had access only to U.S. soil, so we didn't worry too much about under 200 because we were like, that's just poor soil. Um, we've discovered that a lot of the world is very poor soil. Um, so we're working on um, adding to the algorithm a much uh, more robust reading at the lower end. So people, right, if you're below 200, you still want to get there. So we want people to be able to, to look at the trends over time at the lower end. So we are um, we're working on improving that lower end reading just because we didn't put a lot of time into it at the beginning. Okay. Perfect. And then we do have a couple of people asking, you know, questions about um, how many, how many tests can your kit do and what is the availability of resupply and, and maybe right, how, yeah. how they go about So that. this, this is our starter kit. We designed it um, to be pretty robust. I'll tell you, if you fly with it, you get stopped by TSA. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, the starter kit is 135 and it consider it contains all the sort of, you know, uh, reusable things you'd need. And then the refills are really this salt packet, um, which is just a sodium solution. It's totally uh, safe. Um, and the test cards. So when you order a, a starter kit, it has 10 tests in it. Um, we also throw in five for people just to play around to get used to it um, because you do have to get the technique down. 
and then you order refills, right? Um, uh, and the refills run between $10 a test to about $6.75 a test, depending on how many you order. But you only need to have one starter kit. Um, and then the app is free. So the app, we don't do any subscription. We don't take your, you know, children's names or anything as collateral. The app has video instruction, written instruction, timers in it to make sure you do it right. And it stores all of your information. So you need to be on a network to download the app, but you can read a test offline, which, you know, if you're if you're on a remote farm or, or in Africa somewhere, that's what you do. And then um, the results are all stored to the cloud so that you can download them into Excel, um, combine them with other data um, and all that stuff. So the app is, is, is really good. I have a, a picture of it. Well, I don't, everyone has an app, but it's a very nice app. It's free to download. Uh, it's just called Microbiometer Reader. You do need it to take the test um, and you really should open an account, but it doesn't we don't, we, you just put an email in there. There's nothing uh, mysterious about it, but it enables you to um, compare results over time. And you can name your sample so you know where it came from. It'll also GPS locate where you took the test. Um, so it'll help you go back to the same spot every year. Very cool. And then that kind of maybe brings us in. Uh, Jenna here asked, how often should, should we be testing these soils? Yeah, so that's like a million dollar question. We are not agronomists. So we were like, let's just make a test and then see how people use it. But of course, people want guidelines. So what we say is people need to think about what they're trying to do with their soil. The first thing we recommend is people sort of baseline throughout the year, right? The seasons are different. Um, so, so sort of get a feel for it. One of the most important things in this test and most soil testing is consistency, right? We know that in a field, things will vary, but go to the same place, right? Because you're more interested in the change than the absolute number. So if you go to the same place every year, right? You can see the change as opposed to going to, if you go to a different place at a different time of year, you'll get sort of two changes, right? One, geographic and one seasonal. Um, so we recommend that people sort of use it initially to get an understanding of sort of what's going on beneath the soil and then to use it to evaluate practices. So for example, and it depends on, you know, if you put down an amendment in December, nothing's going to happen in two weeks. But if you do it, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in early in the season, usually a week or two will show a burst of microbes. The other thing we encourage people to do is understand the, the natural changes in the growing cycle and the seasons, and then to understand when, if you use an amendment or an input, they'll often give you a big boost of microbes right away. But really what you want is a sustained growth. So you want to say you got a new compost, right? You test the soil before, you test it a week or two after, and then test it a month later to see if that is still going on. Because that's the real indication that, that the product is working on your soil. And on our website, we have, you know, some, some, uh, you know, some more information about it and some links to other sites that'll help you understand it. Okay. Yeah. And, and with these tests, um, can you, are they detecting the presence of the amount of mycorrhizal fungi? or just maybe fungi family in general? Yeah, we don't differentiate. So we're not gonna tell you what kind of microbes there are, good or bad, or what kind of fungi there are. So it's total fungal content. Uh, mycorrhizal is just the kind that most growers love, right? So if you are um, doing an amendment, it's normally mycorrhizal, but we don't differentiate the, the between the types of microbes. Um, and, and we're probably not going to because uh, the, the diversity in the microbial population and the rate at which they mutate is really fast. Uh, two microbes can have a DNA difference of 20%, um, which is the difference between you and like a cricket or something. I mean, it's really big. Um, and um, and I mean, it's so big because they don't have very much DNA, right? One, their denominator is small. So that's how the math works out. Um, so it, it just gives you a total number again. And again, it's a way for you to gauge things over time, not to, not to 
do it once and done, which is why we're trying to get, as we work on manufacturing, we're still a fairly new company. We've only been selling about four years. We're trying to drive the costs down so growers can really test much more often. Okay, okay. And so do you have, do you have any examples of how farmers have used this information and then it maybe changed or improved their practice after after utilizing this and then do they have good results um, well you know the thing is our test doesn't help you improve the soil itself right we're not an input um but we have worked with a lot of um and, and on our website we have a lot of different sites but a lot of amendment companies have been using it to sort of show and prove out to their users how it's working and almost to work sort of as a compliance tool, right? If you say to someone, look, this, this product will like cover crops, right? We know cover crops are amazing. They, they do all kinds of things for the soil. But if you go to someone who's never cover cropped and you say, if you spend the time and the money to put down this cover crop and then roll or crimp it in a year, things will be better. Well, that's a long time and a lot of money, right? But if you, if they understand the role of microbes and you say, look, I'm going to show you if you have two fields, bare and cover crop, right? We'll do some testing and you can see that the microbes with the cover crops are doing better, right? And we know that if the microbes are doing better, when you plant again, your crop will have a head start on the bare soil. So it's sort of proving out um, for people who understand and want to improve soil microbial life, that the practices they're doing are working. So that's mostly how it's used. Um, I will say that that people who are growing sort of indoors, um, again, it's not, cannabis is sort of a funny thing because they're not really our customers, but, um, but they work in such small time periods and controlled environments that it's a really good sort of lab, right? Um, not that it's a good practice for everyone, but, you know, they'll come in, they'll throw all this crazy stuff in the soil and they'll see, you know, this colonized, this didn't colonize, this went up um, in a very short time period because they're not dealing with whether, you know, the great outdoors, they can sort of do whatever they want. Um, and, and those, you know, when you use a container soil inside, that's a big deal. Um, and then we, we've also... Uh, toyed with academics, um, but it, it's been a pretty bad experience, I got to say. Um, either they do the test wrong or they, they do a test sort of inside um, for farming, which is not done inside, so it's not that helpful. Yeah. Um, or academics are used to doing soil testing where you take the soil, you put it on a shelf for two years, and then you test it. Um, and that's, you know, our test, I mean, I guess our test works, but it's not meaningful information if you test um, dead and dried out soil. Okay, very good. Um, Lyle here uh, is asking if you can describe the difference between a soil test, compost, extract, and extract tea results. And he also mentioned in here that he has a test kit and he does like it very much. Great, great. So, um, you know, we're a new company. It was started by a bunch of PhD scientists. So we are learning things. Um, so one of the things we did is when we, it, it's to, we like to call it a soil test, but you can also test compost tea, compost extract, um, and of course compost, right? So if you have our app, which he does have, when you start your test, it asks you what are you testing, okay? Um, the test for soil and compost are the same instructions. The test for compost tea and extract are different instructions because of course they're liquid. And the scale that reports the numbers are, I'm not going to lie, for compost teas and extracts are a little arbitrary, okay? <laughs> so like a really good compost tea will read at 20. A really good soil will read at 500. Um, I don't quite know why the founders, um, unfortunately, uh, Judith Fitzpatrick, who founded the company, passed away, so we can't ask her why they picked that scale. <laughs> but I think they wanted to differentiate soil and compost, so it was very clear what you were testing. Um, and and um, so that's what there. We are working with Earth, Earthwort Labs to change that, to make it a little bit more reflective of how many microbes are in compost tea. So if you have a microbiometer and you test compost tea and soil and you get 20 
and 600, know that that's not the same scale, right? Um, and we also had to, um, we put a little, a little meter, when you get your test results on the microbiometer, it, there's a little slide that says fair, good, and excellent, I think. And we did that because people sort of wanted to know. So if you get 20 on a compost D, it'll say, you know, good or excellent um, to help you sort of gauge it. And the reason we differentiated compost and um, soil is because of that gauge. Compost is normally much higher than naturally occurring soils. So that gauge will sort of give you a different number. We did that because we're all used to the education system and everyone wanted to get an A, right? It, it's not really that meaningful to know if it's if it's good or excellent because everyone's just trying to improve things. Um, we also have a big big PR problem in, in Australia. Australia is about 20 to 30 percent of our sales. They're very progressive in agriculture and their soil is really quite terrible. It's a desert, right? Which compounds everything. So, so we're trying to come up with a better scale for them so they don't all feel like they're getting bad scores. Um, but there, you know, two or 300 is pretty good. And that's just you know, soils are different around the world. They can sustain different amounts of microbial life. You just can't um, you know, make a soil in, in, in Australia look the, and perform the same as a soil in, you know, Africa. Iowa or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that kind of votes well or true with like organic matters too, you know. You oh, and the other thing is we have not, uh, um, for compost teas and extracts, fungal to bacteria is not available. Um, there's a lot of validation and testing we do, and we just have not been able to get to that yet. Um, so if you test compost teas and extracts, you will not get a fungal to bacteria ratio that is only available for soils and, comp uh, and composts. Um, I will say something about compost. Um, the compost world is, is really exciting and interesting and it's terrific. There are some people out there putting some really weird things in compost um, uh, that's not good or bad. Our test, again, is designed for God-made soil, right? If you are making a very cool compost with lots of things that don't normally occur in soil, you could be interfering with the natural tests. So I always warn people, I'm like, look, if you have all kinds of things, particularly things that are heavily, heavily pigmented into your compost, um, you should be a little bit careful. We also tell people the real measure of the effectiveness of a compost is if over time it improved your soil microbial content, right? Not that the compost itself, although that's a good quality test is good. I mean, if you have the world's most amazing soil compost and you throw it on concrete, it's not gonna make the concrete fertile, right? Um, so, but, but you wanna test actually the soil after it gets, um, uh, worked into the to the ground okay no um yeah you kind of brought up you know a lot of sales in australia norm here is asking about the prices um on the website is that for i guess you know how does that work when it comes yeah so so we, yeah, India, we do have, africa in particular is what he's asking in africa yeah so again we're four people we're, we're struggling but if anyone out there is is terrific in tariffs let us know um the kit is 100, 135. It ships free to US anywhere you want to go, right from us. We don't use Amazon. We just do it ourselves. Um, and then we ship flat rate internationally for 40. International, in, depends on where you're going, can be different because of tariff and customs. So for example, in Australia, which especially with COVID took a long time to get there and customs, we have a few non-exclusive distributors that have stock there. Okay. And it's much easier to get there. Now, because our distributor paid the customs and the shipping and everything, it's not 135 for a starter kit. Um, and then we have some um, some people in Europe as well, um, although we will send directly, um, but, it, but it does create problems. Getting to India and Africa has been a little bit harder for us um, in terms of sort of direct access. Um, Usually if someone's, a lot of the times our test kits in Africa are because there's NGOs or groups in the United States that are going there. And so we ship them to them and they bring them because they get, you know, through it all. Um, but, but we're hoping to work on that. So we, you know, we do ship all over the world. Um, we don't ship to Russia or China just because we, that's too complex for us. 
Um, and we do have a hard time in, in South America because some of those tariffs are like 200%. Um, and it makes people very upset when they buy a $135 starter kit and get a $400 customs bill. <laughs> about imagine <laughs> yeah so uh but a lot you know we're a very small company if you write uh, i'll put my slide back up um but if you go to our website microbiometer.com and you hit like email us you email you know the entire company all four of us with questions um we also have bulk pricing so if there's companies that want to arm sort of their salespeople with these to show users or give the users the kits we have much cheaper pricing um if you buy in bulk and our bulk prices start at 20 kits so it's not you know it's not thousands of them um and uh but but a lot of amendment companies have sort of armed their people with it as an educational tool yeah yeah um i i've, I've seen those uh around a little bit with some especially our elevate ag team has, has been yeah utilizing them yeah and then we're in africa so we've sent them to kenya primarily um earth fort who's one of our really awesome partners and has has sort of stepped in as um as a company that helps us do a lot of our lab work because they have access to other soils they are doing a lot of work in africa and they uh include the microbiometer and sort of their soil um kits um and uh the the um Matt Slaughterer, who runs Earthfort, is going to Africa about twice a year, Kenya and Uganda. Uh, and we're hoping to go with them next year, which will be really fun. Cool. Um, Chuck here is, uh, he's kind of just, he's made a comment, maybe wanting just kind of your, your thoughts on it um, over, you know, testing different soils or different material, different parent materials, um, parent color materials, will that uh, skew the results? maybe, you know, progressive soils or, you know, maybe not so progressive soils, you know, how does, how does that maybe, do you kind of understand what he's, what he's asking? No, because I don't know what progressive soils are. Sorry. I'm, maybe, I'm... oh, you know, maybe more biologically progressive soils is probably what yeah. so asking about. It, yeah, because it is a color metric test. Our tests can get interfered with significant amounts of pigment in the soil. For the most part, those are chemically sort of added, right? If someone's doing a weird amendment, the, the big example is a, like biochar, right? So sometimes people put biochar in compost, right? Or, or huge quantities of biochar into a soil, right? And that will skew the results two ways. One, biochar, you know, is, is got a lot of color in it. And two, if you have soil that's 20% biochar, right? When we do our test of a half a milliliter of soil, it won't really be half a milliliter of soil because 20% of it is taken up by biochar, right? So you will have a sort of lower number, right? <laughs> because you put so much, and, and biochar is a terrific product. I'm not saying anything against biochar, but when people are doing very sort of strange things or they have a very weird soil, and again, you know, we are learning so much about soil around the world. For example, very we learned very high iron soil can be a problem. So we now include, I can't find mine. We now include a magnet. So if you have a lot of iron, you just put a magnet underneath it and it sort of precipitates out the iron, right? Because the iron okay. will, will mess up with it in a color. Um, if you do have some soil that is like, you don't know about it, um, you know, send us an email about it. The other thing is, we, you know, we're we're a small company. We're, we really believe in what we do, but our users are sort of our, you know, our science team. <laughs> um, and so if someone has a strange soil that's giving a weird reading, we often pay for them to send it to Earthfort for them to do some testing because, you know, and we'll cover it to say like, huh, you know, that's interesting. Um, we, we love the idea that the kit being used sort of everywhere, but we do know that that's sort of unrealistic, right? Um, agriculture needs to sort of stop the one size fits all, which we, you know, so the, we're, we're trying to gather places where the test can be interfered with other very strange organic matter or different practices. Another example would be really, really, really heavy sand soil. Sand is very heavy. We have a precipitation process in the tube. 
And if your soil is predominantly sand, the sand will precipitate out so, so quickly that you'll get a very low reading. So we're working on testing very sandy soils so that you read the test not after 20 minutes, but maybe after five, right? Okay. Um, you'll get a more accurate result. So, um, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys that soil is incredibly complex. Um, and one of the hardest things for us is in order to get soils from international places, you have to be a USDA certified lab to get those soil samples, which we're not. Um, and Earthfort is, so they can test soils from around the world. Um, so we, you know, we can, we can say, oh, you know, we didn't know this about the soils in uh, Israel, for example, you know, maybe we'll have to uh, change our test or put a note or something like that. Okay. Very good. Um, and then Ken here asks, how does the test differentiate between bacterial and fungal content on in their ratios? Yeah, so it is a it is a it is a broad estimate. So it's not quite the same as 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 microscopy would be. What we did is we discovered that as as our algorithm read it, that fungi are one much bigger, right? And one often pick up a slightly different pigment. I will say that there are so, some fungi that have zero. Um, color, okay? And those we don't pick up. So, you know, the test is a very good quick and dirty measure, um, but it is not uh, perfect. Um, you know, I have no problem <laughs> acknowledging that. Um, so there are certain types of fungi that never, they're always clear. We won't pick those up, but the algorithm picks them up because of the slightly different color and the much bigger size. Okay. Um, and I will say something, our, our test um, has this funny little Thing that whisks up the soil for 30 seconds. And it's one of the more important steps that when people do the test, if you whisk your soil for too long, you will destroy everything in there. Um, uh, the first thing you kill is nematodes. Our test does not pick up nematodes because we obliterate them, sadly. Um, but when you follow the test, you do want to make sure you do all the timing correctly because you can, um, you know, if you whisk it too much, you will you'll you'll break up all the the fungal um, filaments and they won't be read properly um, and you will uh, lice a lot of the microbes so they will also not be read okay yeah I think that probably leads well into our next question here from Matt and and just asking what are some of the common mistakes that users need to avoid when performing this test yeah so the common mistakes um, the 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 higher your education level is in science like masters and phds think they can use their own test tubes you can't you have to use our weird test tubes um because they fit this uh um whisker perfectly the most important thing is that you use fresh soil okay so if you have soil from last year sitting on the shelf and you test it and compare it to this year it's, it's not, it's going to be information, but it's not the same information. So fresh soil and that you follow the instructions as much as possible. Okay. Um, the, the, there's videos, there's timers, there's all that stuff. You want to make sure that you whisk for 30 seconds. There's a timer in there. And then you read the test after 20 minutes of settling. Okay. Um, and that you read the test card within two minutes of putting it down. So it's mostly a timing issue. The other issue is the, the more you can do everything the same, the better, okay? So when you do a lab test, every little step can have a micro change, right? And they can add up. So if you can take do the test and read the test card in the same place even every day, that's better, okay? You don't wanna do it in direct sunlight, that kind of messes with the camera. And if you use the same phone, it will be more consistent, okay? So same lighting, same phone, even same person would be very good, right? To keep it consistent. I will say, I, I, I give a big thing about fresh soil. You can, and most people do, go on the field, throw some soil in a Ziploc bag. If you keep it in a cool, you know, dark place for a couple of days, you can still test it, it's fine. It's just when you throw it in the freezer for six months or keep it on the dash of your car for a week, um, there'll probably be changes. So you don't have to test it like within seconds, but normally 48 hours. Um, 
as long as you don't let it dry out is pretty good. And if you're very, very interested in fungal content, you want to test as close to a root as you can. Like some people pull up a little plant and they'll scrape the roots. Okay. Because that's where a lot of the, the mycorrhizal fungi will be. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and I guess kind of going back to, um, you know, your experience in, in other countries, um, uh, are they making their own compost and biological amendments? And, and can you describe any of that process at all? You, you know, know? Uh, in, in Australia, which, which is, you know, a, a, a fairly comparable agriculture to the United States, they sort of have the same uh, compost and, and, and inputs as we do. Um, so, you know, there are places making it. In, in Africa, like Earth Fort is going there to help them um, make their own compost. Um, particularly in, in, in Kenya and Africa, I don't think there's a lot of places that are making compost now or even compost teas, right? Um, and so that's one of the, the things that a lot of companies and NGOs are working to, to do. We know in India, um, in India, the, the government sort of subsidizes fertilizers and, and pesticides. So they have a lot of control over it and they are mandating soil testing for farmers. Um, but it is sort of a wild west out there in terms of what soil testing is doing, you know, what it means for the farmers. Um, <clears throat> but again, they're in a lot of places, the government is sort of encouraging fewer chemical fertilizers and herbicides and pesticides, but there's, there's, nothing else for people to be doing, right? So there's sort of a, a disconnect between the two. Um, and I think that's giving a lot of business opportunities for um, American and Australian companies to go into those places to bring their technology, um, particularly if it's easy and it uses local materials um, to, to sort of fill in that gap between what do you do when you can't use um, fertilizer and pesticides and you have nothing else, right? Okay. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> um, I think we got maybe, we'll go one more question here and, and kind of wrap things up and maybe get some closing comments from you, Laura. Um, sure. This one, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of let you chime in too, but I'll, I guess I'll start off uh, with this one from Mark. Um, which crops are fungal, and which are bacteria dominated, or, or is this an effect on quality, nutrient density of a crop, and do some crops prefer one over the other? You know, when it comes to, I know, like mycorrhizal fungi, uh, things like oats, flax, um, sorghum sedans, and spring peas are all very highly mycorrhizal type crops. I, I think Mark too, if, if you want, you could, you could call us and then maybe we could get some more specific details on what crops you're wanting to pair. But Laura, do you have anything to, to add maybe or comment to that that you maybe have seen? No. Again, we leave that work to you guys because um, it's it's hard. It's complex. It's, it's a whole nother business model. <laughs> so I want to hear what you, what you guys think. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, th those are the, those are definitely the species that are my go-to when, when you're wanting to, um, you know, to build that mycorrhizal fungi. And, and the, the, the important thing is, is too, after you've done that with those crops is try to keep something growing in there. That's going to keep that, that biology living and growing. So yeah. Um, yeah, Mark, you could definitely, you could definitely contact us. Um, and we could we could certainly look into some other more specific species maybe that you're referring to. But um, I think with that, Laura, do you have any closing comments? Um, any? No, I'm I'm just putting my contact information into the chat. Okay. There. Um, I will say that if you send an email to info at microbiometer, you'll get all of us, and um, and my staff is is much more on top of things than me, sadly. <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I just want to say thank you for having me on here. I think it's really cool. I think that the adding sort of education and information and testing um, to the cover crop and amendment world is is really key. And it's really neat to be working with with companies like yours. Um, and Keith, I'm, I'm, I'm going to send you my soil because uh, where we we are is a 200 acre farm and we need pastures to be cover crop. So we're pretty excited about getting uh, getting a little regenerative ourselves on our farm. Yep, we'd be happy to help. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you.
Uh, but no, thanks for having me. Please, and and when to reach out. Or again, we're a small company. We love to talk to people, um, and we like sort of negative feedback too. If you find that that you have a kit, um, I will say that we, you know, you can order kits yourself. Um, and if you email us, you can ask for a discount code, and we'll give them out like candy. So, ask for that. Ask for that discount, and you'll get it. Well, very good, Laura. I, I appreciate you taking time to you know to educate and and verse us more on. You know this testing kit. I, I think it could be a great, yeah, tool for for any grower or any maybe company that's wanting to, you know, quantify the, you know, maybe it's a cover crop they're planting or a biological they're putting down to to see how their their soil is performing um, in a more, uh, you know, easier way, maybe a more quicker test um, than than sending it off to a lab. I think sending it off to a lab certainly can can be of of some good info as well. Um, but yeah, we 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 don't. We, we encourage people to do sort of all kinds of testing, yeah. but this is just a little more immediate. So thank you. Yeah, so definitely appreciate it. And appreciate everybody else uh, hopping on uh, for this today. Uh, this will be recorded and, and put onto our YouTube page. And then next week we have Armin Miller uh, with Elevate Ag and Nausea uh, LaFontaine, I believe is how you say her last name. And they're just going to be kind of talking uh, microbe and plant relationships about, you know, at the same time as today's webinar. So we will hopefully see you all next week. And Laura, thank you again. Thanks. Everybody have a great day.